Michael Lind, welcome back to The Realignment. Thanks for having me again. Good to see you, Michael. It's been a year since we had you on the show. We spoke about your book, The New Class War, a month before lockdowns, coronavirus. So the first question before we get into Joe Biden is basically going to be, how has or hasn't the development in the U.S. and the world over the course of the last year either confirmed or refuted ideas in your book, both looking at the left and the right? Well, in my book, The New Class War, I argue that our politics is now polarized not so much between left and right, but between insiders and outsiders. In the inside culture, I call technocratic neoliberalism. And I think our the response of progressives and many uh, centrists to a COVID-19 uh, by idealizing uh, scientists like Dr. Fauci uh, sort of illustrates this culture that the experts know best, right? The, that the ignorant masses need to be uh, kept at a distance. Uh, also the cult of personality around Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, illustrates the preference of a lot of technocratic neoliberals for policy to be done by uh, authorities that are insulated to some degree from the, the voters, uh, uh, whether it's administrators or uh, international agencies, or in this case, the federal judiciary. At the same time, uh, in the new class war, I'm very critical of what I call demagogic populism, uh, illustrated in different ways by Donald Trump uh, and, and Bernie Sanders. And my argument is that while uh, this can channel legitimate grievances against the establishment, uh, in practice, demagogic populism, which has long history in the American South, in Latin America, even in, in cities in the Northeast, uh, you know, tends to, uh, to fizzle out uh, in a cult of personality around the mayor or the governor, or in this case, you know, around President Trump. Yeah, you. I remember you saying that in January, and I, I guess it was uh, more taboo um, in order for people like us to say something like that. And it's obviously all borne out, Michael, exactly as you predicted. You were like, yeah, you know, most populists are charlatans um, in the history of American politics. And, you know, Trump's very last act as president was pardoning Janine Pirro's husband of tax fraud. So, you know, I mean, I, I can't help but think that that was the perfect thesis. Uh, here's something I've really actually let's let's start with the Biden speech. Uh, we were talking right before the episode. What is this? The name of this podcast is the realignment. Is this a realignment in American politics? Is it a restoration? I was watching Biden's speech and look, there's nothing to quibble with there. He's like, I'll be a president for all Americans. It's about as humdrum cookie cutter of a speech. I'm not criticizing it. I think that's why 80 million people voted for him. What do you make of that speech, the tenor and its context within I've seen you call it the five crises of the American regime. Um, just what, what what is that going to do um, for our politics in the moment that we're in right now? Well, I'm, I wish the best for the new president, the government. And I, you know, I hope our leaders can find lots of areas of consensus. Uh, but just as an analyst, I suspect that uh, in particular, the anti-Trump coalition peaked today. Mm -hmm. It will start disintegrating immediately. Yeah. Uh, because for four years, you've had this incredible omnibus coalition of almost all of the power centers in American society, you know, of, of uh, militant uh, neoconservatives, uh, libertarians in some cases, radical leftists, uh, progressives, you know, establishment third way neoliberals. And they all agreed that we have to put aside our differences and get Donald Trump out of office. Well, he's gone now. So, so I think it's nothing but downhill uh, for that coalition uh, as, as the deep fissures within it become evident. Uh, and I think much of the elite hopes this is a restoration. That is, you know, it will be like a retconned TV show where it turns out the last few seasons were, were just a dream. And, you know, we're going to go back and, and write a different plot, you know, starting in 2016. Uh, but, but the country has changed and the world has, has changed and the party coalitions have, have changed. Uh, Biden was pushed uh, by uh, the Democratic establishment in part in the hope that he would win back a lot of so-called Reagan Democrats or maybe Trump Democrats. Uh, but, but in fact, uh, he did best with uh, college educated uh, affluent whites who are moving right. into the Democratic Party. Uh, and the Democrats, as you know, uh, lost uh, 
uh, uh, substantial numbers of African American, uh, Hispanic, and Asian American voters. So uh, even though they still get the majority of the non-white vote, so so those who hope for a restoration, uh, I think instead we're just at a midpoint in an ongoing uh, partisan and policy realignment. Mm-hmm. So this is this is something I've been toying over in my mind, Michael. I'd love to have your thoughts on, which is that. I'm generally of the mind currently that this was probably the high water mark for a, any sort of Trumpian nationalism. And the reason I say that is it seems increasingly clear to me Ari, that there are two irreconcilable parts of the current Republican coalition. I'm not saying it can't change, but I'm just saying for its, the iteration that we saw, you have this kind of QAnon wing of the party. And which is also, you know, compiled with a lot of working class voters who are there for Trump specifically, not there for Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell tax cuts. But Liz Cheney, Mitt Romney and McConnell do embody maybe let's say like 15 to 25 percent of the party. And it just seems increasingly, and you could see this in the impeachment battle lines of like Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney, Adam Kissinger, those types of people being incredibly, basically to the point where I don't know if they can for the longer exist in the same literal political vehicle of the Republican Party. And the way that I really saw this self manifest was in Georgia, right, was Georgia basically made it so the somebody like David Perdue or Kelly Loeffler was basically they were screwed either way. If they embrace Trump's stop the steal, then they lose their their base. But if they, you know, continue to indulge it, which they did, they lost those suburban Republican voters who were basically like, screw this, I'm out. Maybe not out forever, but I'm out for right now. How do you see that current coalition of the Republican Party? Am I being, you know, too bearish? Are you more optimistic? And how do you see things changing in that regard? Well, I wouldn't characterize it as optimism or or pessimism. I'd try to be objective, but I think that the Republican Party is in good shape electorally. Uh, they did much better than expected in races across the country. You know, in, in this year's election, in last year's uh, election, uh, you know, they're they're picking up slowly but surely a lot of working class non-white voters, which they need if they're going to lose uh, uh, college educated whites, uh, and you know. As long as the Democratic Party repels enough voters, then the Republican Party will win elections to block mm-hmm. the Democrats. It's it's not a, a dynamic thing. Uh, it's just that they're basically seen by voters as a roadblock to stop something they think is worse. But uh, if you if you think the Democrats will alienate substantial groups of voters. Then that can translate into into Republican votes. Right. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, I think I agree with you. There is no, even though they can win elections, the Republicans, in, as of now, cannot govern. They have no governing philosophy. Right? You know uh, the what you call the QAnon right, but it was the Buchanan right. It was yeah, right. It was, it was always the new there. right. right. Yeah. You know, there are like five or six hot button issues at any given time. You know, guns and, and abortion and so on. And those may be legitimate issues, but uh, you know they're basically symbolic and tribal, uh, and they're they're not attached to any philosophy of political economy or foreign relations or jurisprudence or any kind of coherent uh, of viewpoint. Uh, the the declining establishment wing of the Republican Party has what I call stealth libertarianism. Mm-hmm. That is, it's libertarianism, and then you, you wave some flags during the election, but essentially it's the Libertarian Party, uh, and that's going nowhere. Uh, you see a lot of the same voters who vote for Republicans in the states also vote for minimum wage increases and, and uh, you know, so on. So uh, uh, we're, we're in this weird situation where, unfortunately, because you want to have two dynamic parties, uh, the Democrats are the dominant party by default when it comes to actual policy. The policy disputes that matter are within the Democratic coalition between the neoliberal Democrats like Biden and the Clintons and Obama and the progressives uh, to their left. Uh, And at this point, the Republicans can win and they can win back the House maybe and the Senate and they can have a 
trifecta maybe in 2024, uh, but but they're essentially reactive. You said something earlier that I want to dig into specifically relating to realignments. You said a political realignment and a policy realignment, because there's a distinction there that matters not just in terms of the show's branding, but actually as you conceive about whether or not the Republican Party can be dynamic. From my perspective and my interpretation of your work is that a huge part of America's political realignment has to do around class and education. It's not necessarily tied to race in the same way that previous ones were. And as it's tied much more to, as your Biden vote is tied to whether you attended college or graduate school or not, that is going to lead to a bunch of opportunities for people on the right, um, both demagogic and otherwise, to focus on the discourse about elites, to focus on, that's why you saw a lot of people focusing on the small businesses closing, et cetera. That's the political version. But there's also a policy version, which is Republicans should win over the pan-ethnic working class through promoting the minimum wages in certain cases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My concern is that the Republican establishment will discover, and this is already happening in media circles, that you can affect a political realignment by focusing on stop the steal, a higher IQ version thereof. You can focus on the, it's terrible that they've locked us down and we should just not do that without having an actual alternative plan there. How do you think of and separate the policy and the political and how do we get out of that way? Because I just don't want a world where the right discovers they could talk about how it sucks that the Democratic Party is full of all the Harvard Law graduates while also at the same time winking and giving them the same people salt tax repeals and <laughs> the actual um, tax cuts that were happening in 2017. Well, I think at some point, a policy of realign realignment will catch up with the partisan realignment within the Republicans. Uh, it takes some time. It took a generation or so in the Democratic Party. By about 2000, uh, you were already seeing the Democrats were becoming the outlanded Republicans, you know, of the mid 20th century or the Wendell Wealthy Republicans. They were internationalists, free traders based in New England and in the areas settled by New England on the you know, they, they lost their traditional base of farmers and labor. Uh, but you still have these Democrats, and there are a few living fossils. I admire him, but he's a relic of Sherrod Brown in Ohio, you know, praising FDR and Truman and farm subsidies, you know, and, and the labor, the steel unions. Uh, and there's just no one. And finally, the Democrats looked around and there weren't any farmers and there weren't any steel workers, you know, in the whole auditorium. So, so they kind of, you know, they have realigned, they are now the party of offshoring, of, of uh, free trade, of low wage immigration. Those were the country club Republicans, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the Republicans now, if you look at their base, they are the Roosevelt Democrats. Uh, they are, their core is white Southerners and so-called white ethnics, particularly Catholic Euro-Americans, but you know, more and more African-Americans, particularly working class, and uh, Hispanic Americans, but th they have this Chamber of Commerce, Cato Institute Libertarian elite, intellectual and policy elite, which honestly is, is just in the wrong party. I, I looked the other day at the education statistics, all the way up until the late 20th century, the Republicans got the college educated people who are now Democrats. FDR, now this, this is amusing, he did very well among uh, high school graduates. And he just, you know, he, he did best among uh, people whose education did not extend beyond sixth grade. <laughs> he, he got that K through six vote. Yes. Right? He never, he never. Which was got, huge, Matt, which, which you yeah, think was, about. By the way, was, that was, was huge. huge. <laughs> yeah. but so, so he never, ever got the Ivy League vote, you know, or, or even the small town, you know, college vote. So, uh, so how will this come about? I think realignments come about ultimately as a matter of, of calculation by politicians. Uh, and right now, I think a lot of Republican politicians are afraid that if they, they uh, anger the club for growth or these other libertarian donors, then they will be taken out you know, in, in the next election. But at the end of the day, elections are determined by warm bodies and voting booths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you get more and more Republicans who can survive attacks by libertarian donors, then they're going to look like a paper tiger, I think. 
eventually. Now, it doesn't solve the other problem, which is the think tanks are, and this is true of democratic think tanks too. Uh, think tanks are funded by people who, who run the spectrum between libertarianism on the right and centrist neoliberalism on the left. I mean, that's it. There's no Bernie Sanders think tank. There's no Trumpism without Trump. There's American Congress, American Affairs, some other other small, uh, but, you know, disproportionately influential outlets. But I think that uh, what that means is the Republicans uh, are going to have to use the resources of government itself. If the only national institution you control is elected office, right? Uh, then the parties are going to have to do the thinking. You can't, uh, you can't expect grant-funded organizations raising money from billionaires to come up with something that billionaires don't like. And <laughs> other parties in the Western world, the parties have their own party institutes, right? And they answer to the elected politicians and their voters. So, so now this may take some time. I'm surprised it's taken so long, frankly. Mm -hmm. Michael, there's one point I want you to expand on a little bit, which for a more left-leaning audience, I don't think they intuit this as much. What you said is that the only debates in America which matter today are between mainstream Democrats, basically like centrist neoliberal Democrats, and progressives. Now, I think that conservatives, or many on the right, are beginning to understand that what they think is literally irrelevant, and then that what they fight about amongst each other is even more irrelevant than that. And so when all is determined by that kind of internecine conflict within the liberal, co not even necessarily the coalition, between the liberal elites in terms of their discourse, what does that mean for our society? Just expand a little bit more on that. Well, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, a political scientist named Samuel Lubell came up with his sun and moon theory of the parties that he argued that throughout American history, we usually have a one and a half party system. Uh, there's clearly a dominant party, uh, and the essential debates take place within that dominant party. And it was the Lincoln Republicans up until the 1930s, and then it was the Roosevelt Democrats up until the 70s and 80s. Uh, and so the, you, and he called that the Sun Party. That's the Sun. The whole solar system revolves around it. Yes. The Moon Party has like the bright side of the Moon and the dark side of the Moon, and it splits into Me Too Sun Party people. Right. They just want the Sun Party uh, policy watered down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the dark side of the moon, as it were, they're just radical rejections. They're just against everything. Right. And I think that's a real danger that the Democrats are becoming, you know, the de facto uh, majority party. Uh, and if, if they win uh, all of the elections except for the ones where you have rural overrepresentation in the Senate and maybe the Electoral College now and then, they're the majority party. Uh, and, uh, and it's very difficult for the Moon Party, once it gets locked into that position, to progress because there's this deep, deep division between the radical rejectionists who just would want a total counter revolution uh, and the accommodationists who want to be accepted. Uh, you, so you sort of saw this in the 50s and 60s. I mean, this is where Buckley, Goldwater, Reagan conservatism right. originated as complete rejection of everything. The New Deal, the Civil Rights Revolution, they're just against everything. They became more moderate over time. Uh, and at the same time, they did criticize the so-called modern Republicans like uh, Eisenhower and others of you know, basically being watered down New Dealers. So, so it's, it's not a good position to be in, you know, to be the, the, the uh, satellite uh, of the dominant party. Mm -hmm. What I like about this is, like we mentioned at the top, we're recording pretty much a year to the date after our last episode. And at the time, speaking of ideas which have changed a bit, I was much more bullish on the there is no libertarian path out for the party until, frankly, you had the lockdowns and the genuinely grassroots Obviously, there was a lot of astroturfing, especially at the start. So that's uh, the protests at the state capitol, all those dynamics. A lot of that was very cokey. But moving in, 
at least with my social media and Sagar, I want you to speak to this too, because mm-hmm. you get this from listeners. There is a genuine small L libertarian. So not the DC beltway variety right. that we all have various degrees of beef with, but there's <laughs> actual people who I know back home who are like, screw government. This isn't even about Dr. Fauci. This is like, why can the government tell me that I have to close my store or I can't keep my gym open? It's very, it's very folk. It's very, it's very grassroots genuinely. And I just don't see that libertarianism having any interest in using government. It's just so – the the, the governing organs within the right are just so atrophied and the top-level philosophy is just so weak. And frankly, a huge problem is that all of the folks I see on the right attempting to provide a Trumpism after Trump or giving a framework are all mostly Ivy League people who, you know – have various degrees of inability to actually reckon with that reality. So I don't see the smart version of the anti-lockdown take who is going to disagree with me on a million different things. But at the end of the day, I know they're capable of providing a justifiable, suitable alternative. So how does that dynamic work? What I'm really getting at is if your coalition or your part of the coalition has no control over the university system, popular culture, the think tank area, how do you actually create sustainable alternatives when you don't have the incentive to do so? Well, I'm a professor and an author, and I've been accused of being an intellectual, I deny. But uh, uh, you can actually govern a country if most of the intellectuals are against you. Uh, you know, and, and you just come up with policies among the politicians. And, and community groups and so on. Uh, the intellectuals, for the most part, in the Roosevelt era were either left-wing socialists who thought the New Dealers were pawns of the capitalists, or, or they were conservatives of various kinds. There weren't that many New Deal intellectuals. New Deal policy was hammered out by these, you know, many of them crooked Southern small town politicians who got elected to Congress, you know, and, and you know, uh, urban ethnic bosses like Carmine de Sapio. So th- there was no master plan that, you know, a bunch of intellectuals came up with in 1932 uh, and implemented. And the plans they had, I've read them, uh, were essentially tossed aside because they were so unworldly, you know, planning the economy and so on. If you look at the long hegemony of the Lincoln Republicans from the Civil War and Reconstruction all the way up until Herbert Hoover, the intellectuals hated them. They were seen as just, you know, a corrupt gang of protectionists, you know, representing manufacturing and, and uh, you know, they had some labor support and so on. Uh, you know, they, they would engage in culture war issues, you know, refighting the civil war, waving the bloody flag, as it was called. Uh, and, you know, they dominated the country in policy. So, so I, I guess I'm, I'm pushing back a little. I think that, uh, and if you look at the libertarian think tanks, which if, if I became a libertarian tomorrow, I could retire rich. Right. I mean, there's so much money. So could we. That we'll oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, should, we should start our own libertarian thing. There's just so much money. But what have they accomplished? You know, in 30 years, there have been endless plans for privatizing Social Security. Toxic, dead on arrival, even when Republicans control all three branches. Right. Open borders, not going to happen. Right. You know, free trade, uh, uh, isolationism, not going to happen. I mean, you know, there'd be some... There's more liberal trade and less liberal trade. So uh, so I, I think you can overrate the importance of ideas as, as opposed to policies. So thanks for the pushback because I want to moderate what I said. I completely agree to the you don't necessarily need intellectuals. I'm more speaking about the folks who run the technocracy. Sagar, this is your thing you always get mm-hmm. really jazzed up about. But in many ways, the Trump administration – was doomed the second that the travel ban was written in a terrible way and was just incoherent. The Trump administration in many ways was screwed when a lot of the only people they could hire were weird racist people who were then having to were had to be publicly let go. And then that creates a vicious flywheel where, well, I don't want to work at DHS because there's that anti-Semite there and it just goes on and on and on and on. So what I more mean is it doesn't seem like the populist libertarian coalition that exists right now has the capacity to even put in place folks who have an interest in or ability to implement the policy points. Because you're totally right that the libertarian, all of the work of Cato Institute and the Mercatus Center has not been put to good use over the last 30 years. 
But I do believe if you did elect Justin Amash president, almost certainly I would trust them to implement all of the policies they yeah. want. I do not think the same thing is true of the populist, right? And guess what? The same is true on the populist left too. This is the general problem of populism. So what do you, so when we like, now that I've redefined it, like what do you think of the point there? Well, if you're the more popular party that is frowned upon by business elites and universities and so on, uh, the way the Democrats used to be, the way the Republicans are now, uh, again, I think you have to use what you control, which is the government, uh, so that uh, you're not going to get uh, a whole lot of, you know, let's say, Trumpism without Trump, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, you know, more inclusive nationalist, less kooky, you know, uh, uh, program. You you have to have cadres. You know, the the Plum Book, uh, the president appoints. 4,000 some odd appointees, right? Well, where do they come from? Well, for the Democrats, since they now control the commanding heights of the corporations and of uh, the media uh, and of the universities, they have their pick and of the think tanks. Uh, the Republicans, I think, are going to have a narrow pool. It's got to be broader than Fox News, right? And QAnon or whatever. But there's still a pool there. And that pool is a congressional staff. Uh, and also uh, administrative agencies. So the real problem, I think, a lot of these problems with the Republicans could be fixed uh, if you had a sufficiently cohesive caucus hmm. in the U.S. Congress uh, and you had career paths for staffers. Uh, unfortunately, Senator Hawley seems to have damaged his career by you know, endorsing these lies about the election being stolen. Uh, but, you know, people like that, you know, they're staffers. Uh, when you have a uh, president of your party in the White House, you go to work in executive agencies. Uh, when you leave, probably for the foreseeable future, Republicans are not going to be that welcome, <clears throat> you know, on, at Uber and Lyft, you know, and, and at centrist think tanks and so on. Uh, but they can go back to work for the government. Uh, you know, in fact, if, if you look at the really transformative politicians, uh, they were not outsiders. They were not amateurs who came in at the age of 60 or 70. I mean, Washington had a career in Virginia colonial mm -hmm. politics. So Lincoln was a career politician. He practiced law. Uh, FDR, career politician, more or less. Uh, so, but you really need what the Soviets called the cadres. And, and so I, I'm agreeing with you, Marshall. That is, there, there were no cadres in a sense. Trump was kind of premature. That's assuming he was trying to do something other than increase the value of his brand. It's not clear. Uh, but when Reagan came to power, you know, you had all of these people who could be appointed. Uh, and some of them were from business and think tanks. A lot of them were from, from uh, the House and the Senate and uh, from congressional staffs and from state governments. So I think that's where you have to look for your farm team. It's the government itself. That's really helpful. So as we are setting up the credibility and the work that you're doing, something a lot of our folks are thinking about is the future of both parties. And something you said specifically, you wrote a piece in, I believe it was May, it was, you wrote a piece in early 2016 before the general election where you said the future of both parties are Clintonism and Trumpism, which you hear that and you think about let's focus on the Clintonian side, you hear that, you think that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't seem possible. But at the same time, Joe Biden won the nomination, resoundingly so. Can, so can you speak about how in many ways your conception of the idea that people were underrating the power of center-left post-Reagan neoliberalism as a political force? Can you just speak about that evolution over four years? Because the one thing that I don't think your piece anticipated was the rise of the squad and the dynamic around that. Well, that, that's uh, right. Uh, I, the piece was back in 2015, I think, in Politico, mm -hmm. uh, where I argued that the Democrats had a Clintonian future uh, and uh, the Republicans would have be more populist and nationalist than necessarily, you know, resemble uh, Trump in other ways. Uh, and that's just looking at their constituents. You know, the, uh, the, the partisan realignment is nearing completion. It started back in the 60s and 70s when the Democrats started losing the white working class uh, to the Republicans and uh, the Democrats started getting more and more 
upscale people. If you look at 1972 at the McGovern uh, coalition, it was already foreshadowed what we have today. It was the top of the socioeconomic stratum and the bottom. Uh, so, so in a way, this is delayed Nixon McGovernism. Uh, you know, that's now Clintonism, Trumpism, or Bidenism, uh, Trumpism. Uh, you know, I, I was surprised by the strength of the support for uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, but it turns out that the social base for that kind of left is inherently weak because it is largely people among, uh, first of all, they're college educated young people for the most part, right? You know, th these are not, you know, people who, are, for one thing, they're working. I mean, they're not protesting in the streets, right? If you have a, a day job, you know, in, in an essential industry. So, so these are young college educated, you know, uh, would be professionals. Many of them work in the universities and the nonprofit sector and so on. And I think, and it's true here, it's true in Britain, it's true in Western Europe. This is the social base for the so-called socialist left. But here's the problem with it, Marshall. Where do they get their money? Who pays their salaries? Billionaires. Billionaires pay their money through grants, either directly or indirectly through the Gates Foundation, through Bloomberg Philanthropies, and so on. So, you know, it's kind of like what Herbert Marcuse, the Marxist, called artificial negativity, <laughs> right? Where you have a bunch of people who depend on billionaires giving them grants, depending the, the, uh, denouncing the billionaires. So I, I, I don't take it that serious, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Michael. Uh, you definitely just pissed off a, a part of our audience, and, and that's okay. It's When we try to articulate it, it, look, I mean, it always has to be reconciled. It's like when you find yourself marching in the streets on the same side of Jeff Bezos, like, are you really reading a populist revolution? Get, go ahead and send me your hate mail. I've heard it all before. Uh, it's all good. There's something, though, that you said, which uh, in the past, which I absolutely love, and Marshall highlighted this, which is you said, neoliberalism is the disease populism is a symptom and democratic pluralism is the cure. And one of the things I've always, always appreciated about your work is the advocacy for more democracy in order to solve the problems that we have. So look, we've just spent a lot of time outlining the partisan coalitions, obviously the problems of the technocratic neoliberal elite, that's we've spent hours talking about that here. What do we do about it um, in the face of, you know, Trump's Basic, fa basic failures, you know, in terms of trying to do anything about it. Joe Biden just was overwhelmingly elected the president of the United States, at least 80 million votes. That's a lot of people, the most votes ever cast in American history. That is in its form a form of democratic pluralism. But if we're to order and reorder and try and fix our society, how are we to do it, Michael? Well, I think the basis, and this is a project for a generation or several generations, is to rebuild grassroots mass membership organizations. Uh, and in the 20th century, the most important were local political machines up until the 70s. The parties were actually national federations of local clubs. That's disintegrated now. You know, they're, they're labels that billionaires in New York, like Donald Trump and Michael Bloomberg, can, can compete for. Uh, so you had the local uh, political machines, uh, and sometimes they were corrupt, but they were in touch with the with, uh, folks in the neighborhood. Uh, you had uh, churches were much stronger, uh, churches and, and synagogues in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and then you had unions. Uh, and as I like to point out, the two most uh, important civil rights leaders of the 20th century, A. Philip Randolph and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., were respectively a union founder uh, and a pastor. Uh, so if you flash forward to 2020, we have this system in which uh, the parties are really labels uh, that groups of uh, billionaire funded politicians or self financed politicians compete for. The intelligentsia, such as it is, and the media are owned or get grants from the same small group of billionaires. Uh, and uh, for long term secularization, I don't see this reversing. Fewer and fewer people you know, are, are part of religious congregations. Uh, so the thing about the working class, uh, the working class individuals uh, have no power as individuals. Uh, they don't have, uh, they have one vote, which doesn't count for much. Uh, they have no prestige. They, they have no contacts. They have no celebrity. Uh, 
uh, if, if you're part of the working class majority of all races, native or immigrant, the only thing the working class has is its numbers. And those numbers are powerless unless they are organized in disciplined hierarchical organizations, not spontaneous mass rallies, where it's not these social movements like Occupy Wall Street or the Tea Party, a bunch of people milling around uh, for a, a day or a week is carnival, right? It's like ancient Rome, it's like Latin American Catholic countries. You have carnival, you blow off some steam, uh, and then you go back, you know, work for the boss. Uh, so, so I think in a way, the answer to what ails us uh, politically is not going to be solved directly through the electoral political system. It's going to take institution building. And this country was good at that 100 years ago. You know, civil society, you know, the United Way, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the farmers lobbies, the Grange, the AFL, later the AFL-CIO, you know, the the churches, the Catholic Legion of Decency, these were all grassroots organizations. And unless those exist, then politics is going to be a spectator sport where you have uh, rich people and their agents battling it out while we watch on TV. I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, Michael. Uh, I, j- I want to hammer this home because it's something that we- I actually basically stole it from you and I've been emphasizing it ever since, is I'm like, what you just said requires and actually is I wouldn't call it a libertarian solution, but it is a conservative solution in that what you just talked about are balancing forces which do not require the government, aka unions allow for collective bargaining in order to negotiate a wage without having to set something from the top. Churches and others being able to organize and put external pressure, you know, left for a lot of conservative grievance right now currently is like, well, nobody listens to us in Hollywood or elsewhere. As you pointed out in your book, they used to listen what? whenever it was an organized constituency which had real political power. But as you point to in an increasingly secular world, and importantly, this is where the elite comes in, which is that. Marshall mentioned the lockdown constituency. You have this grand, genuine folk libertarian uprising against the lock, lockdown. Here in D.C., what does that translate to? And this is what I warned of here and elsewhere. It's Stephen Moore being like, see, we need to open the economy so we never have to spend a dollar in stimulus again because, and he said to this me, to, to me, quote, government spending does not stimulate the economy. And you're like, This guy is out of his mind, but he is the representative functionally of the folk libertarian movement, half because his organization funded some of that, but also because he is the one in charge of translating that into a policy answer. So it seems like a two sides of the coin problem. So how do we create these institutions, you know, in especially if they are to be non-governmental as citizens? Like what should civic minded people who listen to this podcast do if they want to contribute to that? Well, a few years ago, I was invited by a a famous billionaire to spend the weekend in a castle outside of London with a bunch of other notables from around the world to come up with a new social contract for the Western world. Uh, And unfortunately, they didn't offer me plank bear. So I was tempted to send an email back saying, well, I'd like to come, but my private jet is in the, you know, getting its muffler fixed in the garage. And uh, uh, it's not going to come from plans. I mean, I, I co-founded a think tank. I mean, think yeah. tank you know, are good for giving advice to politicians. But if you look at effective movements that changed American history, they started off in a particular place. The Republican Party started off in Rip on Wisconsin. You know, there was the free soil movement. There were the suffragettes. You know, there was the the, uh, Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. As the name suggests, there was Southern, Mm -hmm. right? There was the Grange and and the Farmers Alliance started off in in, uh, my native Texas and other places. So, uh, you know, what what I tell my students is, uh, as as a university professor, the first resort should not be a law passed by Congress or a presidential executive order. Like maybe you should actually like knock on some doors of your neighbors and see if you can settle at the neighborhood level. And if that doesn't work, go up. Uh, Now there's some things you can only do at the national level, but you have to have an army first. 
right? And there, there are two forces in politics. One is dollars. The other is people. And people power takes three forms. In the government, it takes the forms of votes or denying votes. Uh, in the economy, it takes the form of uh, boycotts, or rather in culture. You can boycott movies you don't want. You can boycott mm -hmm. TV shows. And in the economy, it takes the, the form of organized labor in some form. I'm sorry. Uh, individual workers have no bargaining power if you're a janitor, you know, negotiating with, with Microsoft Corporation. It has to be organized countervailing power. Uh, and it, now note that the power of the organized working class is not intellectual. Okay, they're not making plans and things like that. There's a role for policy experts. Uh, they have veto power. Uh, if if something is harming them, they they can throw the switch and veto it. They can boycott the movie. You know, they they can sit out the election. They can or vote for the other candidate. They can strike if they're organized. Uh, so so power to the masses does not mean. Uh, doing what public opinion says, uh, but it means that that they are able, you know, to uh, put the brake on something that, that 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 is affecting them in a bad way. Does that make sense? Yes. This, yeah, so this is why I distinguish pluralism from populism. Populism says, okay, fifty-one percent of the people say this according to a poll. That should be policy. No, that's not the argument. I mean, you know. Uh, uh, pluralism is uh, we have a community of communities. The nation is not just a community of individuals. These communities ought to be self-governing as much as possible. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, small government conservatives should embrace the pluralist vision, as well as civil libertarian progressives who don't want an overpowerful state. So ordinarily, the state should reign but not rule. Uh, it should let managers and, and employees cobble the, the details of, of health benefits and wages instead of trying to legislate everything from Congress. Uh, it should allow, you know, religious organizations, you know, uh, and all secular organizations for that matter, ethnic organizations, to meet with media executives and say, hey, look, you're portraying our people uh, in a demeaning, stereotypical way, right? Uh, instead of the government, you know, trying to pass a law. So the government should only step in as a last resort. But notice the difference between pluralism of this sort and populism. Populism says there's this one guy or maybe this one woman mm -hmm. uh, who has this mystic affinity with me, you know, the little man right. or woman who watches on TV. And I believe this one person is going to save us. And that always ends in tears. Pluralism, you have lots of intermediate authorities each within their respective spheres, okay? So maybe the, the Catholic clergy is upset with, you know, uh, pornography in the media, okay? And then they work on that. Uh, you have labor representatives. You have, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of industrial representatives, uh, and they interact. Uh, and there's, so power is diffused through the whole system. Uh, so, so that kind of, pluralistic diffusion of power uh, rather than a concentration of power in the central government, particularly if the central government is captured by a small number of very well educated and, and very rich people. I think that's what we need to, to push for. And we need to be wary of, of the false alternative of populism, where some charismatic media star or tycoon or Trump was both is going to come in and parachute in and, and just say this, you know, because that's not the way the world works. Mm -hmm. There's so much there, Mike. I want to hit a couple points. Number one, the perfect example of the operationalization of your pluralism idea is look what happened with Pornhub and the credit card companies. What happened is, and this is the key thing about the pluralistic idea, you have to think of society as sectors. You had Nick Kristoff columnist at the New York Times. The New York Times is a institution. It's the, obviously it's not the paper of record it once was, but in the center left places that control our society in many respects, it's still taken as serious gospel. You had activists, some who are left and some who are right, who then who then had their work, and then that work was then amplified 
by the New York Times and Pornhub and the all of the different companies that provide credit card services had to change everything within a week. Compare that to a conservative saying, we're going to appoint conservative senator to hold a couple hearings where we're going to yell at the Pornhub people and expect them to make any difference. That doesn't lead to any change whatsoever. Because once again, I'm not saying that if you're on the right and you dislike Pornhub, you have to say, I love the New York Times. And they're my best friend. But you have to understand them as another power structure in society that in certain cases, you can actually form a coalition with to get things done. But I want to get to something that I think is going to serve as a barrier to people actually building these bigger institutions that that on, on two different levels. So one, I'd like you to comment on this very, very, very annoying Occupy Wall Street libertarian left in many ways idea that organizations don't have leaders. I mean, I remember if Occupy, the whole thing was we don't have a leader. We don't have a representative. And if you look at BLM today, regardless of your th- of your feelings on BLM, BLM is an organization that do- or a movement that doesn't have leadership. But I just saw today that it's been estimated that over the course of the last several months, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars went to BLM organizations. It's completely unclear. And this, and we'll find this for the show notes. This article is in the mainstream press. It's pretty unclear what all of that vast amount of money actually went towards. When there's no actual leader, when there's no actual institutions, it's impossible to actually hold anyone accountable. So I would just like you to comment on, and then one final thing here, I love your point about mass. I love your point about centralization, but we've had libertarians on this show. I'm thinking Beric Torenberg, who are obsessed with the idea in the 21st century that everything is going to be about decentralization and getting nicher and nicher. Your goal was to get a small community of people who agree with you. Your goal is to get a newsletter where there are a thousand people who pay you a hundred dollars a year instead of a mass market publication that doesn't pay you as good of a rate. So can you just comment on all these broad phenomenon that I feel are going to serve as mental blockers to actually creating the institutions and giving people the conceptualization they need to address these issues. Yeah, let me begin by applauding your comments, Occupy style, by twinkling. <laughs> <laughs> it's laughing is, is too violent, so I'll twinkle. Uh, but well, let me start with the second point. Uh, you know, yeah, narrow casting and targeting and all of this. If, if what disproves that in politics uh, is church buses, uh, if you look at the late in the 1990s and the 2000s, who were, who were who provided the muscle for the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? On the Republican Party, it was evangelical Protestants, who are a very small group of the population, and they're not actually a huge proportion of the electorate, right. but, but they, they had, were hugely influential because church buses would bus people to the polls, get those physical bodies to the polls. And the African-American church did it, and they still, they're the reason Biden is president, mm-hmm. right? It was older church-going uh, African-American Protestants. And if you don't physically bust them, you know, at least you get them to get out there and vote. You have voters' guides and things like that. So I think that the the influence of the media, uh, and I'm not saying you, you share this view, but I think it's, it's overplayed. Uh, you know, most working-class Americans, and that's three-quarters of the population, are not that politically attentive. They, they get their news somewhat randomly, mostly from radio TV. They're not heavily online. Uh, so there's a big difference between those who go to church and don't uh, and, and those who go to unions or don't, and the organizations can turn them out uh, and have disproportionate political power. Uh, now, remind me of your first question. Oh, my first, my first question was, many of these organizations have embraced the, no, not even organizations, because they are organizations. Many political movements, especially in the post-financial crisis space, have conceived of the idea that they shouldn't have leadership, they don't have leadership, it's all going to spontaneously gel into something coherent. That's why I refer to this idea as left libertarianism. I'm stealing that from Matt Stoller. But how do you respond to that conception? Because I feel as if that is what is going to stop everyone from doing things. The point about BLM is the fact that billions of dollars were given to were given to BLM organizations. That's perfectly fine. But ultimately there's not going to be any ability to cohere that into something sustainable or into something that people could be held accountable for in the way that centralized institutions that have have leaders are actually able to have. 
Well, I think that's the goal. Uh, if I'm writing the check for Citibank or Nike or whatever, uh, I, I want to decapitate mm-hmm. this potentially threatening movement by co-opting its most talented leaders, right? So they come up to me, you know, and say, I hate Citibank or, you know, whatever it is, down with finance capitalism. And we say, well, what do you say to, you know, a few million dollars, you know, for a nonprofit? And you'll be the president, right? Uh, you know, and uh, maybe we'll put you on a board. Right. So I I think a lot of this uh, part of these so-called social movements, uh, I think, are carnival, as I said. I think they're just like theatrical release of frustration for most of their followers. Uh, They're also recruiting tools for the national elite. Right. Uh, And and this is nothing new. Like if you look at I, I spent a lot of time in the 90s with the you know the people around the Clintons and Tony Blair and the third way neoliberals. And if you looked at what they were doing in the 60s and 70s, they were radical trotskyists. They were trying to overthrow capitalism. <laughs> you know, now, now they were flying on private jets, they're on corporate boards. Mm-hmm. Uh so so to some degree, you know, this is uh I, I think it's kind of elite co-optation of of uh, protest uh uh leaders and uh it doesn't work with the right-wing version of this. So, for example, if you look at the anti-lockdown protests, these are largely small business owners, right? So what are you going to do? Like, you know, tell Joe the plumber, it's like, well, what if we give you money to start a small, socially impacted nonprofit, Joe the plumber? Yeah. <laughs> he wants his plumbing business to survive, right? Uh, but it does work on the left of center. Uh, with essentially channeling a lot of people who would be on the outside uh, banging on the door, and then you, you bring them in. I so it's actually quick thing, not, Mike, a not, not to not to interrupt. I just had a revelation with your framework. It seems to me you have two different power centers that are driving the dynamics here. So on the left, you have the broad nonprofit apparatus and the grantees, but on the right, you have the media. So from my perspective, the way that you would co-opt Joe the plumber. If Joe the Plumber, this is a reference, especially to our Zoomer listeners, to a plumber who heckled, um, I think it was, uh, yeah, during McCain McCain during the 2008 campaign. If Joe the Plumber heckled a person today saying, I'm a small business owner and I'm getting screwed away these lockdowns, you know what you would do? They'd offer him a Newsmax show and turn him into a useless culture warrior. That is the version well, of co optation that goes there. <laughs> well, but that's obviously what you would do, right? That, you would, you would, you would, you would say, "Look, Joe the plumber. Oh yeah, the lockdowns are terrible." But you know what the real issue here? The real issue is that they're libs, and libs are terrible. And yeah. insert statement, and you give him a podcast, and probably pre- he was actually a, not a yeah, bad performer. Fine. Yeah, yeah, it sort of sucks fun. for this is the last Joe the plumber reference we're probably making on the show, but it sucks for him personally that he came of age right before the boom of independent media and podcasting. So he didn't quite have the pivot opportunity. It's a real tragedy. We well, well the point I made in a piece uh, for a leftist magazine called The Bellows mm-hmm. was uh, I, I distinguished between the uh, professional bourgeoisie, that is the, the college credential professionals, who are afraid of being proletarianized, afraid of sinking in the working class. And they provide a lot of the muscle for the left in the Democratic Party. And then there's the small business bourgeoisie, the Joe the plumber types, who are much of the muscle in the political uh, base for the Republican Party. Now, the upshot of my analysis is uh, these are still elites. The small business owners are a fairly small, but fairly affluent group compared to most of uh, the public. So are, you know, uh, people with PhDs working at Starbucks. Uh, They're still part of the social elite. Uh, Mm -hmm. We have not heard from the actual three quarters of the population that is working class, either last summer or, you know, left wing, right wing. Well, why? Because they're working. They're working. They don't, they don't, they can't fly across country. Right. To dress up in a Viking outfit and storm the Capitol, right? I mean, <laughs> they they can't go from city to city with their spray paint and their antifa hooded outfits and all of this. Uh, as a friend of mine who was a sixty radical told me one time, he said, uh, "Your mom and dad had to have a lot of money for you to take part in the summer of love." So 
So, you know, the working class people, I don't think they're represented by small business owners. The actual number of people who own their own business in the U.S. Uh, and I'm all in favor. I want to help them out if we can. Uh, it's less than 10% of the population. Right. Right. Uh, the number of people with a BA is about a third. Uh, even from a you know minor uh, college or university. Uh, so what are these other folks doing? Well, they're working. They're working. They're they're not on TV. They're not engaged in these extra political spectacles. They're pretty much ignored by uh, the two parties. Uh, and to me, that's the real tragedy of this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of our our time in general, but of this time of plague in particular. I think that's exactly right. It's funny. I, I'm thinking back when you're talking this way about the small business owners of, I remember Trump and a bunch of right wing commentators trying to meme the idea that these like boat parades, these Trump boat parades <laughs> were like this grand working class uprising. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm like, these are the just these like small business owners who are actually like pretty wealthy and what? are culturally conservative and like didn't go to college. I'm not knocking it, but like Let's be honest. They'd be out there knocking doors for Romney. They were out there knocking doors for McCain, Bush, all of them. They're just like probably a little bit more obnoxious now that it's Trump. It's not a working class coalition, as you or not a working. It's not representative of the working class, as you point out. Like working people are actually working, and so let's finish on this note, Michael. Which is that if you actually want to see the working class in America have power, how does that come about in the near term, or is it? empirically just going to be a generational pro project of rebuilding non-governmental civic institutions and try to reorienting some of our civic life to have power once again in America? Well, I think it's a generational project because, uh, you know, you can have benevolent uh, politicians who are backed by tycoons who have smart advisors, and you can come up with good policies for people. Right. But, but it says, you know, like in, it says in the Bible, you know, and then there arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. You get your good Pharaoh and then you get your bad Pharaoh. So mm -hmm. so unless you have your own uh, army, you know, you're, you're never quite safe. Uh, I think and I was a real critic of the moral majority uh, and Pat Robertson in the 1990s. But I think at this point in history, uh, you're more likely to get. Uh, faith-based organizations, churches and synagogues, maybe mosques and I don't know, you know, druid circles. You know, I'm, I'm open to this. I'm looking sure, at this on yeah. socially. Right. They're more likely, uh, they're kind of like the last mass membership institutions in American life. Now that about 6% of the private sector workforce is unionized, that's lower than it was under Herbert Hoover. Uh, and the political parties are gone as functioning, you know, knock on the door organization. So, so curiously enough, uh, I, I would not write off uh, the churches and other uh, religious institutions of other faiths uh, because they have warm bodies mm -hmm. uh, every week uh, and they have buses and they can get people to the polls. Uh, so it might not be the same form as the 90s, you know, evangelical religious right. Uh, and even if they're a minority, even though uh, religion is declining, that's somewhat overstated because if you look at so-called secularization in the U.S., the decline is almost entirely among mainline Protestants. Uh, but you could argue that secular wokeness is, in fact, the highest stage of Methodism. I'm a Methodist. I would say this. <laughs> it's, in fact, a form of, of mainline Protestantism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but if you look at Catholics, if you look at uh, evangelicals, they're fairly stable uh, as, as a part of the population. Uh, and the other thing about uh, uh, the Christian church in particular is it's trans-ethnic and trans-racial. So, so to the extent that you do have a problem on the right of these white nationalist sectarians, you know, uh, uh, infiltrating it, it's not going to happen. Uh, in, in, in the churches uh, hmm. or the synagogues or the mosques for that matter. So, so warm bodies, you know, uh, if you don't want government by dollars, then you need to have actual physical people whom you can deliver the balls. Hmm.
I think that's really well said. Michael, just phenomenal return to the podcast. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you, Michael.